By now, you will have seen my video on what are performance valuation metrics. You'll have watched my video of how you duct a performance valuation, and you'll see the example of Zara versus Ralph Wren. If you haven't seen them yet, go back to the previous videos, watch those, and come here, because today we are talking about how you write up your performance evaluation for a piece of work. So we're going to start by giving you the simple rules of presenting results, and then I'm going to go through an example write-up that I've created in Word. So what are the rules? So you need to analyze scale data, which is between one and five, normally. Maybe you're going to be um, doing task time or frequencies, but you're doing these in simple ways. And a picture is the best way to do this. So a bar chart or a box plot is the best way. Pie charts really are not very good because they lie to you all the time. Won't go into that in great detail, but people find it very difficult to compare um, by pie charts. Actually, I think I'll show you a picture in a minute. Now, when you collect online surveys, um, you have large volumes of data put into Excel, and it's very easy to measure your work. The important thing is that when you're writing up your results, you never show raw data. Raw data is hard to interpret, whereas bar charts and pie charts, not pie charts, bar charts and line charts are easy to understand. Now, why are bar ch pie charts so bad? Well, here's three pie charts, and they all look very similar. Moved around a bit, but there it is. When you look at the underlying data, you see the truth is very different because it, they just lie. So bar charts are always better than pie charts. Also, just giving averages lies because one test might have a higher average than the other. The distributions may be unequal. So we've seen this in the previous example where I put the average scores on a pie chart in a bar chart and I compared Zara and Ralph Wren's scores. Ralph Wren looked like it was higher on task time, but it wasn't actually. When you did the stats, it turns out they're the same. So you need to conduct statistics in order to Find out what's really going on. Simple numbers are not good enough. So now, in the previous videos, I introduced you to um, this flowchart to just understand which test to use. If you have normal data, which is um, a uh, non-significant Kolmogorov Smirnov test, then you go into your t-test and ANOVAs. If you have a significant Cole McGough Smirnoff test, then use non parametric tests. So you cross Carl Wallace's, your Wilcox assigned rank, and Manwit U test. If this is new to you, go and look at my previous videos. They will go over everything about stats that you need to know and explain this chart in full. But it's not just about using um, clear uh, bar charts, line charts, and a clear statistics. You also need to write very clearly. And by the way, the videos on statistics also go over how to write up the stats. So go and have a look at that if you're thinking about doing stats in your performance tests. Now, when you're writing, writing clearly is so important. People understand short sentences. Trust me. It's got impact. It's clear. We understand it fully. And here we go for the next one. Long sentences, on the other hand, have the singular ability for, of the former test's unique characteristics to be lost in a exquisite but unfortunately misguided tendency to take the reader on a journey that may demonstrate your linguistic superiority, yet is lacking in body substance or the points that could equally be communicated in a few words. Long sentences are hard to understand. Write short, get to the point, think about what the re reader needs to know and work only on that. If you do that and you think about the reader, think about what they care about and write short, your work will be impactful, be understood, and it'll have more effect. Also, it's good to start with your final takeaway message at the start of the analysis so the reader knows where they're going. It's not a mystery, it's explaining. I'm now going to go and give you an example of write-up that I've completed for a website. If you've not seen the actual analysis I've done, I believe it's the previous video to this where I go through comparing Zara to Ralph Lauren. So I start with a quick introduction which gives me the problem I'm trying to solve. 
So to determine if the UX design team of Zara.com need to redesign the website to increase performance and corporate advantage, the UX design team need to run performance evaluation. So long sentence, okay, but it gets to the point. You know what this is about. Performance metrics are essential to the UX design process and the user's, user's subjective rating of websites correlates with the user's performance. So there we have why this problem is important. So we're saying we're doing it and we're saying why it's important. Then we talk about the aim. So the aim is to assess the performance of Zara.com against its aspirational competitor, Ralph Lauren. To achieve the same, the researcher must determine the ability to complete a task, so task success, the effort required to complete a task, task time, and the efficiency through which a user can achieve a task, errors and lostness. So I'm saying these are the ways. There's a big thing up there. You've got to achieve it somehow. Break it down into parts, and here's the parts. Then we've got methods. How do we do it? So the reader knows what goes on. Um, I'm not going to read through everything. It's on the screen now. You can pause the video and have a good read. Um, but I'm saying, you know, who are the people that are involved? Where did this take through? Why did I choose that number? You know, I'm actually giving a full reference to it with Nielsen. Data collection. How did I collect the data? What did I do? What software did I use? You know, all these items. Think about, you know, letting somebody recreate my study and collect data in the same way. And then talk about analysis. Um, so, so we applied uh, non-parametric statistics. Why do we do that? Explaining what it was. We're explaining um, how we calculate it, which is um, with an online calculator. And we're talking about how we interpret the effect size, which comes out with Cohen. So really, really simple items. We could go into more detail about the equations we use, but for now, this is absolutely fine. Then results. We actually start with stats because that's the important part. You know, that's the big takeaway. So we used a Wilcoxon signed rank test to investigate Zara, had a higher um, task time than Ralph Lauren. Test revealed no significant difference. Okay. And then we visualize that zero difference. So it's a really short, simple way of writing up. This is how you write up the stats clearly. And if you don't quite understand these parts, again, look at my previous video about writing up stats and I go through all these bits individually. Task completion, it's a carbon copy. I'm repeating myself, but I'm repeating myself so the reader can just see that there are no differences and I've visualized it here. Errors made, once again, I'm explaining what I did. I'm explaining I used Wilcox and signed rank. I'm explaining there is no difference and then visualizing it. I don't need to go any further right now because I'm just giving the results. And then the, the lostness is more interesting because we have a significant difference and achieved a moderate effect size. That's good. So we know that's how things are. Then we put a slight interpretation on this about um, you know, Zara having high efficiency because it's below 0.4. So it's all good. Then we go into our conclusion. Our conclusion gives the basic results. So our results show no significant difference between Zara and Ralph Lauren for task time, task completion, and errors made. Both Zara and Ralph Lauren have a comparable performance. Lostness, however, was significantly different with a moderate effect size, showing that Zara is the most efficient website, is a more efficient website than Ralph Lauren. All scores were at an acceptable level. So that paragraph is just summarizing what the findings were. If somebody's jumped over the results and got just to this first part of the inclusion, they're going to have an idea about what happened. Don't trust the reader to actually read everything. This conclusion really helps. As the UX team undertook the performance evaluation to determine if Zara.com needs redesigning to increase performance, our results suggest the website already has suitable or high performance. A redesign is not required because Zara is not lagging behind the competition. Ralph Lauren. So I'm now interpreting the results. What does this really mean to the reader? The reader cares about that big problem at the start. Is Zara a good performance? Does it need redesigning? Are we as good as our competitor? There you are. Simple. And then we go on to the final part, which is the limitation of our work. So we have a small sample size. Um, it doesn't represent the average consumer. 
So future studies must have a larger sample. You've got the problem with your current study and you've got the future tense. Then we finish off the references and in case you're wondering, I use Mendeley for all my references because it is the best way. This way, in just under 900 words, we've got a full report of performance, something which is easy to read, something which is clear, something which is short, it's got visuals, it's got simple statistics communicated in a clear way with an introduction which describes the problem, the results which are all to the point, and a conclusion which states the results, interprets what they mean, and talks about where we go next. And that is how to write a report of performance evaluation in UX design.